first session today is Beyond Psychiatry, Transforming Psychedelics into Medicines. I would like to introduce our speakers. Firstly, we have Shlomi Raz. He is the CEO of Ulysses. Since founding Ulysses in 2013, Shlomi has overseen the company's research and development efforts. Prior to founding Ulysses, Shlomi was a managing director at Goldman Sachs. Together with Shlomi today is Charles Nichols, Charles is a professor of pharmacology at LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans. Over the past 20 years, Charles has investigated the pharmacology of serotonin and its receptors using mammalian invertebrate models. A little bit broken up, but hopefully you, uh, as the audience, got a little bit of our introduction and, our, uh, and who we are. So, Shlomi. Charles, uh, we are the respective uh, founders, both from a scientific and commercial perspective of Eleusis. Uh, the name Eleusis, of course, comes from the Eleusinian mysteries, and uh, that's been kind of some of the inspiration behind uh, the thinking and really the alignment with our mission. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, specifically Eleusis Therapeutics and the development and transformation of psychedelics into medicines. So we're going to share some slides and uh, we'll kick it off right now. So the mission of Eleusis Therapeutics is to unlock the anti-inflammatory potential of psychedelics. Uh, we also have a separate business which is focused on enabling broad access to effective psychoactive drug therapies. Eleusis was founded in 2013 with the mission to unlock the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. And back in 2013, we identified two opportunities. The visible opportunity, which was to unlock the therapeutic potential of psychedelics within psychiatry. And that mission is currently being pursued by Eleusis Health Solutions. The other opportunity beneath the surface, where most people are really not aware of the therapeutic potential, is to transform psychedelics into subperceptual anti inflammatory medicines. Now, as a prologue, peyote was used as a panacean medicine for nearly 6,000 years by Native Americans, and its use was centered around the therapeutic and stimulating properties of the plant, not around the visionary uh, producing effects per se. It was certainly a component, but the peyote was used extensively as a medicine. Um, Charles Nichols, who will be taking over from this point, uh, discovered quite serendipitously in 2008 that some psychedelics are potently anti-inflammatory. And with that, I'll turn it over to Charles. Thanks. Um, thanks for um, having us uh, talk to you today. And I've, I've been involved with Eleusis almost since the beginning. Um, uh, I think we first started collaborating in about 2014 on this to develop uh, really the anti-inflammatory aspects of psychedelics. And most people are familiar with serotonin as a neurotransmitter um, hormone. It's uh, throughout the body. Its effects are mediated through 13 or 14 different receptors in mammals. And um, the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the primary target of psychedelics, um, highly expressed in the brain, but it's also the most widely expressed serotonin receptor throughout the body. It's expressed in the lungs, it's expressed in the cardiovascular system, the gut, immune cells, uh, skeletal, uh, muscle, skin, eye. It's all throughout the body. And at the receptor, serotonin itself is usually pro-inflammatory. So when serotonin activates the 5-HT2A receptor, it induces a pro-inflammatory response. Um, so we go to the next slide. So what we discovered um, 2006, 2007, published in 2008, were that um, serotonin, while it's pro-inflammatory at the receptor, psychedelics, oh. <laughs> psychedelics are um, actually anti-inflammatory. And um, it's believed that uh, we think it's through differential activation of the receptor. So serotonin, when it activates the 5-HT2A receptor, shown in a little cartoon here on the cell membrane, induces processes that are essential to cellular function, um, cell growth, muscle contraction, inflammation. And it's been known for a couple of decades, um, if not longer, that psychedelics somehow differentially activate the serotonin receptor. Like if you just give high levels of serotonin, this doesn't produce psychedelic or behavioral effects. Instead, what we believe is happening is psychedelics activate the receptor somewhat differently than serotonin to recruit additional pathways downstream of the receptor that induce um, hallucinatory and psychedelic behaviors. 
And what we discovered is there's yet another pathway recruited that leads to anti-inflammatory effects. Okay, so the next slide. So uh, our very first assay was looking at uh, essentially aortic cells from a rat that we took from a rat heart, took them, put them in a cell culture dish, and then treated them with a master pro-inflammatory protein called tumor necrosis factor alpha. It in, in very potently induces inflammation. And what this shows is the effects of TNF alpha in these cells on a pro-inflammatory biomarker called intracellular um, adhesion molecule one. So the 100% level here represents a high level of induced expression. And this nice curve that decreases with increasing dose of a particular psychedelic drug called DOI, which is very closely related to mescaline in its chemical structure, we get a very potent inhibition of the ability of uh, this inflammatory protein to induce inflammation in these aortic cells. The um, EC50, or the half, the half maximal inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effect is really potent. We, um, about 30 to 50 times less than would produce any behaviors. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, what we then wanted to do after we, we had our first publication looking at the anti-inflammatory effects in these cell culture models was to look to see if psychedelics were also anti-inflammatory in an animal because cells are very different than a whole animal. And what we did for this is we took normal mice. We treated them again with our drug called DOI. Here you can see the structure of it. It's related to mescaline. And then after we treated with our psychedelic, we treated with tumor necrosis factor alpha, waited five hours, and then took the organs and tissues from these mice and looked to see if there was any anti-inflammatory effect. So that takes us to the next slide. This is a little bit busy, but we'll focus on the left graph first. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the examination of a pro-inflammatory biomarker called MCP1 in the aorta from these mice. So we take the aorta, we grind it up, and we look at it. In the control condition, there's no TNF alpha, there's low levels of MCP1, no, no inflammation. But the red arrow is pointing to um, the TNF induced levels of MCP1. This is inflammation. There's inf these aortas are inflamed. DOI alone, no inflammation. In the gray bars, you can see a nice decrease with increasing amounts of our drug to completely prevent the inflammation. Um, in the middle graph, we see the small intestine. Uh, very potent effects as well. The, the smallest dose of drug they're using is fully anti-inflammatory. And in the right graph is uh, circulating IL-6 in the blood, which is another inflammatory biomarker. And again, a nice dose response, anti-inflammatory effect. The highest dose of drug that we use is considered about the, the threshold behavioral dose for this drug to induce detectable behaviors in mice. So even our highest dose here is, is a low dose. So this really gets at we're having broad anti-inflammatory effects in several systems and tissues very potently in a whole animal. So the next step was to go to um, a human disease model and see if psychedelics had efficacy to prevent inflammation and rescue inflammation in a model of disease. And for this, we use asthma or allergic asthma. And we can take mice and um, expose them to allergen and have them develop asthma. The symptoms that asthmatic mice have are very similar to what humans have. They have inflammation, pulmonary inflammation, they have mucus, they have difficulty breathing. And we can expose these mice to drugs similar to what a patient would take in an inhaler by nebulizing the drug shown here and um, having the mouse directly breathe in the drug to see how that treats the asthma. So if we go to the next slide, the one of the tests that we can do is to look to see how well these animals can breathe. And to do that, we use this drug called methicoline. And if you look at um, curve number one in blue, it causes the, the bronchial airways in the lung to constrict a little bit. So if you were nebulizing increasing doses of this drug called methicoline, producing a little bit of bronchial constriction. And you can see the higher the number, um, the more difficult it is to breathe. The more methicoline on this blue curve, these mice are having a li little bit difficulty in breathing. The red line are the asthmatic mice. These are the ones that are 
exposed to this allergen that we're using, instead of pollen or something like that, we're using ovalbumin, which is a chicken egg white protein. And you see the red line has a very high number. Uh, this is a hyper-responsiveness. So these mice are having difficulty breathing. When we nebulize and then give the, our drug nose only to these mice, you see in the purple line, we completely rescue the ability of these animals to breathe. And this is a good proxy measure for inflammation that the more difficulty an animal has breathing, the more inflammation there is in the lungs. So here with a very low dose of the psychedelic, we're normalizing and we're allowing these mice to breathe, um, reducing inflammation in the process. And we've shown this not only with DOI, but several other psychedelics. If we look at the lungs of these asthmatic mice, um, we can look specifically at inflammation and the mucus and the fibrosis. The set of figures on the left is um, an airway that we're looking at mucus. The very left figures where it says naive, that's a, that's a normal animal, doesn't have asthma, that's an airway. Um, and a slightly zoomed out version is on the bottom. In the middle of those left figures, you see the pink and the thickness, that's the mucus production. These animals have a lot of mucus in their lungs. And the figure below that with the yellow arrows pointing to the inflammation, that's the inflammation in the lung. Those are the inflammatory cells, the immune cells that have come to the lung that are releasing additional cytokines and causing uh, damage to the airways in the lung that um, produce fibrosis, um, ultimately that's shown in the next panel over. But you can see, oh, no, not the next slide, the next panel. So with our drug, you can see the OVA plus our DOI, we completely rescued the mucus and the inflammation in these lungs. Um, we see this effect to both prevent the symptoms of asthma and in animals that already have asthma, we also can rescue the inflammation. On the left side of figures, we're not looking at mucus, but we're looking at collagen or fibrosis. People who have severe asthma have remodeling of their lungs and fibrosis that over time makes it more difficult for them to breathe even in the absence of having asthmatic attacks. And what this shows is that Giving the drug, um, we, the green in the middle represents the asthmatic mice and the fibrosis that's occurring in their asthma. And when we treat them with our drug, the very right figure, we can see that there's a reduction in the fibrosis and an elimination of the inflammation. So this just shows we can both prevent and rescue the symptoms of um, allergic asthma. Okay, on the next slide, we're looking at the dose necessary. And we found that the dose of the more potent psychedelics as an anti-inflammatory to rescue asthma are 20 times or more less than would produce any behaviors in these animals. And here you can see in this graph, the higher the number, really the more difficulty these animals are having, uh, are breathing, the more inflammation that's present in the lung, and the more drug that we're giving them, the number decreases to the right to where these animals are breathing normally. The amount of drug necessary for the minimal behaviorally detectable dose is shown with this red dotted line. And the therapeutic dose, as we can see, um, is really much less than is required for the behavior of those. So very potent effects as an anti-inflammatory. Okay, on the next slide, this um, is an experiment showing us that the anti-inflammatory effects of psychedelics are exclusively mediated through interactions with the target 5-HT serotonin 2A receptor. And we did this by uh, generating asthma in mice that lack this receptor. They're genetically knocked out for the receptor. We can give them asthma. Um, you can see that they have this response to methacholine in the blue that becomes a little bit more difficult for them to breathe. The asthmatic mice in the red curve are having a more difficulty breathing. But when we treat them with even a high level of our drug, there's no effect to prevent the inflammation. So this tells us, along with a few other experiments that we've done, that the 5-HT2A receptor is really necessary and sufficient to mediate these potent and powerful anti-inflammatory effects. So the next slide. Uh, this is a second human disease model we looked at, and this is a model of human vascular and car cardiovascular and diabetes. It's called the APOE knockout mouse. It's a genetically modified mouse that's missing a protein called APOE, which is necessary for cholesterol, uh, uh, cholesterol uh, homeostasis. And these mice 
when they're fed what we call a Western diet, which is a high fat, high cholesterol diet, over the period of about four months, they develop uh, vascular inflammation, atherosclerosis, plaques, and the symptoms of prediabetes, high cholesterol, dysregulation of glucose metabolism. So in this model, we implanted um, a slowly, uh, uh, a pellet that slowly releases drug over the 14 weeks or 16 weeks that we're feeding the high fat diet. After the 16 weeks, we take out the tissues and analyze them for inflammatory biomarkers, which are shown here. So these are the aortas from the hearts of these mice. We, after 16 weeks, we take them out, we look at them, they're full of fat, um, the high fat fed diet, and we look for inflammatory biomarkers. And we have two different groups, the normal food group um, and the high fat fed group. The high fat fed mice are indicated with the little hamburger because they've been given the Western diet. And the normal mouse food, which is low, uh, low fat, low cholesterol, there's very low levels of inflammation. It, they're normal with IL-6 and VCAM in the blue. Um, however, the high fat fed mice, you can see that there's a lot of inflammation. The IL-6 and VCAM-1, they're increased two, three, four fold. Um, in the mice where we've concurrently given them this slow infusion of DOI over these four months, we can see that there's no effect in the mice that were not fed the high fat food, but the ones fed high fat we've completely prevented the vascular inflammation in this model. So this suggests that we have potential therapeutic effects against treating cardiovascular disease induced by a high fat Western diet. TNF alpha is somewhat different. Uh, the combination of TNF alpha and um, high fat, we significantly reduce levels of this master inflammatory cytokine. Okay, on the next slide, we also looked at total cholesterol. Um, in the normal food, there's really no effect of our drug. However, the high fat food of fed mice, you can see that there's a huge increase in the cholesterol levels of these mice on the left. And the ones that were fed our drug, we have actually, it's not reduced down to normal, but we have a significant reduction in the total circulating cholesterol in the blood of these, uh, these mice. And then the last thing we looked at in these mice, because they are also a model for the development of diabetes, was the ability for them to utilize glucose. And we do the same kind of test that you would do at your doctor to test you for diabetes, where you drink a high sugar solution and then just get your blood glucose checked um, every so often over a few hours. We do the same with the mice, except we give them injection of glucose and just measure the blood glucose over time. And on the left figure, you can see in the dotted line are the glucose blood levels in the high fat fed group, they go up to over 300 um, and then come back to normal over a few hours. In the mice that were fed our drug that also got the high fat, you can see that there's a significant reduction in the maximal blood glucose level. These mice that were fed DOI are able to better utilize glucose. Um, interestingly, we see the same thing in the normal food mice where the, the mice given our drug were also better able to utilize glucose. So this model tells us that not only is our drug anti-inflammatory, especially with, re with respect to vascular inflammation, but we also are having very positive and potential therapeutic effects against metabolic disease and diabetes. So we have um, several animal model data experiments supporting anti-inflammatory effects and a large effort my laboratory now is looking at what's going on in the cells downstream of the receptor, what's the molecular and cellular basis for these anti-inflammatory effects and the therapeutic effects against metabolic disease. We've looked at several other models. Um, one of the more exciting ones is in ocular inflammation. So I'm gonna hand it back to Shlomi um, to uh, discuss those models. Great, thanks, Charles. Um, I think that you know this is the right point, also, just from a company history perspective, to give a sense uh, for the audience of the decisions that we were facing at this time. So this is around 2016, 17, and so we have a lot of promising uh, data that shows that uh, psychedelics like RDOI and others uh, could potentially uh, attenuate inflammation and have other therapeutic effects. But from a clinical development perspective, what we were in search of was what is the optimal path to develop uh, and to transform psychedelics into medicines. And so um, the 
potential in ophthalmology became very interesting because the amount of drug required to have therapeutic effect in the eye is relatively low. And uh, potential for these drugs to treat a variety of conditions in the eye was, uh, was, was quite intriguing. And so we launched a development effort along those lines. First, to identify whether or not indeed the effects that Charles observed in uh, the whole animal and in the respiratory and cardiovascular and uh, intestinal systems would translate into the eye. And then secondly, also developing a new drug discovery effort to uh, accentuate the anti-inflammatory effects of these compounds and to minimize the psychoactivity that would be incidental to their applications in this context as anti-inflammatory therapeutics. To that end, we first explored a, a relatively simple model of inflammation uh, associated with uh, mast cell degranulation. Mast cells essentially are, are kind of storehouses of pro-inflammatory cell messengers that are released uh, in the case of allergic conjunctivitis when an allergen is exposed uh, to, the, uh, to the eye. The 4880 compound essentially degranulates or releases the contents of mast cells uh, in the same same way that an allergen would kind of provoke these mast cells to degranulate. And so you have a very profound inflammatory state. And what we found is that RDOI prevented the um, profound inflammation associated with, uh, with a mast cell degranulation induced by this 4880 compound. And so that was very intriguing. So we saw that we had anti-inflammatory effects at the front of the eye. Further research uh, revealed something um, quite amazing which is that uh, our DOI, as well as other drugs that we are developing, can be applied topically and reach the back of the eye, that can reach the retina. Now, in ophthalmology, this is considered to be the holy grail. And, and the holy grail is obviously very controversial because uh, some people believe it doesn't exist and it's impossible. And some people think that's the only thing worth pursuing in life, right? And in, the, in, the case, in ophthalmology, that clearly is the case. Because if we can develop an anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective drug that can be applied topically and reach clinically relevant concentrations at the back of the eye have truly developed something special that advances the state of the art in ophthalmology. Our pharmacokinetic studies in rabbits, which are the closest anatomical model to the uh, human eye that we can cost effectively evaluate, reveal a concentration of the of our drug in target tissue which supports this type of transscleral or circumferential distribution of the drug around the eye as opposed to going through the aqueous and vitreous humor and so we then conducted another disease model which we thought was highly relevant to the effects which is does topical administration of the drug, of our DOI, uh, attenuate inflammation in the middle and in the back of the eye? And so we looked at a model of uveitis, a model of inflammation which is triggered by the, uh, by the induction or the injection of a tuberculosis antigen into the, the intermediate and back of the eye of the animal. And what we can see is that our DOI was capable of attenuating the anti, the, the, the kind of very profound inflammation caused by the tuberculosis antigen. And this is measured by observing changes in the haze in the vitreous, in the kind of the anterior, the, the posterior chamber of the eye, which has this kind of, uh, uh, kind of viscous uh, fluid in there that, that essentially provides a, a cushion or a gap between the front of the eye and the retina. And so we can see that there was a reduction in inflammation. And so that was very uh, intriguing and supported our, our general development. But then we found something else that was, uh, was captivating. And so RTOI has demonstrated in multiple in vitro models to have a very profound neuroprotective effects. And that's certainly what Charles and Tim Foster, another sponsored uh, researcher at LSU who is a part of our team, have discovered in a variety of in vitro assays that our DOI at extremely low concentrations essentially enhances cell viability and provides uh, protection against toxicity. In this example, we see protection against toxicity associated uh, with, um, with both 
uh, a DL AAA toxin, which is known to cause uh, astrocytes, which are key uh, glial cells in the retina as well as in the brain. They cause them to die. Uh, so protecting those cells from cell death and also um, PC12 rat neural precursor cells. And I think, and Charles, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are multiple labs outside of LSU that have uh, have found similar uh, neuroprotective effects associated with psychedelics, such as our DOI. Right. So what we were interested in is, okay, so if we have neuroprotective effects in vitro, what happens in the uveitis model uh, where you have a very profound inflammation at the back of the eye, which causes retinal degeneration? And so what we discovered was that our DOI protected um, most of the animals treated um, from not only inflammation in the retina, which is the ICF retina chart, essentially is uh, inflammatory cell or, um, infiltrates, so kind of pro-inflammatory cell infiltrates, so reducing the number of pro-inflammatory cell inf infiltrates in the retina, but also, and I think this is you know, crucial to our development plan, keeping the retina healthy despite a very profound inflammatory state induced by the tuberculosis antigen. And I think that's really the kind of the, the real potential here of, of what we're developing is that these drugs are not immunosuppressive. They're not corticosteroids. They're not a jackhammer that knock down inflammation in that way, but rather they attenuate inflammation and specifically preserve cell function in the context of cell stress induced by toxin, induced by inflammation, and what we think most profoundly due to hyperglycemia and the conditions associated with diabetes. And so what we are, what we are focused on right now is developing um, new compositions of matter, new chemical entities uh, like RDOI to treat diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy emerges from the hyperglycemic conditions associated with diabetes. The retina is an extremely uh, high energy consuming organ, right? So a lot of oxidation and therefore a lot of oxidative stress um, and that, that is exacerbated by a hyperglycemic condition. And so this is the leading cause of vision loss in, in working age adults. It is, a, it is a condition which is currently being treated with intravitreal injections. And so if we can provide a disease modifying, symptom relieving uh, topical therapy, we believe we have really unlocked a profound therapeutic potential associated um, with psychedelics. And, and certainly the, in one of the least likely, at least from you know, back in 2013 applications, as a revolutionary drug product within ophthalmology. And so, you know, I think to sum up, uh, serotonin 2A agonists appear to modulate inflammaging, all of the associated processes associated with chronic inflammatory disease. Um, we have found uh, therapeutic effects across inflammation, cell protection, insulin resistance, mitochondrial function, neuroplasticity, fibrosis, and viral replication. Um, there have been third-party labs that have found the same thing. We have found these both at at the lab at LSU with Charles and with Tim Foster, his, his colleague, and we've also found these at CROs. And so we're very excited about the potential of these compounds, not just within ophthalmology, but as a potential to transform the way we treat inflammation associated with aging and with metabolic disease. And so uh, we hope to have uh, phase 1A completed with our new compound in 2022, 2023. And we are also launching a second generation of drug discovery to further optimize the anti-inflammatory effects of these compounds and minimize their psychoactivity. And we believe that from a commercial perspective, uh, this opportunity dwarfs anything in the context of psychiatry simply because you can make a million doses of an ophthalmology drug and deliver it within a, a month or a year, as opposed to the obviously profound, but, um, but not nearly as scalable opportunities in the context of psychoactive drug therapy. Now that opportunity, we believe uh, is best addressed in ways that we're currently developing in our other business, Elusis Health Solutions. And I look forward to describing that opportunity at some point in the future. Uh, and with that, you know, we'd be happy to turn it over to, to questions from, uh, from, from Deb or from anyone else. 
ask you both what you think the barriers are in the progression of psychedelics and how it concerns you. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, at the basic science level, um, a lot of the work that's being done is, is really still through private foundations and other money. And I think one of the barriers is really just um, funding for the development of this class of drug. Um, even though we're now becoming aware of the medicinal potential, um, it's the, the sort of government or official funding through agencies like NIH is, is still lagging. Yeah, I think from a corporate perspective, uh, I don't see any barriers. Uh, I think it's just a matter of execution. I think that there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of new entrants into this, into the field of developing psychedelics into medicines, and we welcome that. Uh, you know, we've been doing this since 2013. Mm -hmm. And given that amount of time, given the seven years plus that we've been thinking about this, and certainly Charles has been thinking about this since 2008, and he grew up, you know, his father's been thinking about this and, you know, for, for, <laughs> for 40 years, uh, David Nichols. And so, you know, we've been thinking about these issues for a long time. And mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, Funding is, is always going to be an issue, but frankly, now that's starting to change. I think there's a lot of investors that are coming around and, and understanding the opportunities here. I think that sometimes for the company, people say, well, I, I, I don't know anything about inflammation. I only know about psychiatry. Or we'll talk to ophthalmologists and they say, wow, what you're doing here is great, but I don't know anything about psychiatry. And I think that one of the challenges that we face is, is helping to explain why there's synergies between those two businesses. And, and our perspective is that the, the same technologies that will enable the safe use of psychedelics in the context of psychiatry, i.e. being able to predict who's at risk to psychosis, being able to monitor someone and being able to understand when the psychoactive effects of psilocybin or LSD have worn off, are the same type of technologies which will enable the outpatient use of these compounds at a subperceptual level by patients, because even though we anticipate that the drugs would not have any type of psychoactive effects, it's always important to have the kind of utmost of safety technology available so that if the regulators say, hey, look, even though you show us these great results, we still want additional protections, that we've developed the technologies to enable that. Much to Shlomi and Charles, we really appreciated your time today.